In this video, we're going to look at an overview of the endocrine system and types of hormones. The endocrine system, along with the nervous system, plays a really important role in homeostasis. It's a major communication system of the body. So in the endocrine system, we use molecules called hormones that are signaling molecules. An endocrine gland releases hormones into the bloodstream, and then they travel through the bloodstream to many tissues of the body, and it will act on cells that have a specific receptor for that hormone. So cells will respond to insulin when they have an insulin receptor. An exocrine gland produces substances that will be released either into the lumen of a hollow organ, like the stomach releasing hydrochloric acid, or the small intestine releasing digestive enzymes, or it can be released to the surface of the body like the skin, and when we sweat, those are exocrine glands. And actually, the pancreas is a cool example because the pancreas is both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. The pancreas is an endocrine gland when it produces hormones like insulin and glucagon that regulate blood sugar. Insulin and glucagon go into the bloodstream and act on cells to either increase or decrease blood sugar. But the pancreas is also an exocrine gland because it releases digestive enzymes and bicarbonate ions into the lumen of the small intestine when we digest food. I want to compare the endocrine system's communication system with the nervous system communication system. So endocrine system, we have hormones as our signaling molecule. In the nervous system, the signaling molecule is a neurotransmitter. Hormones are released from the cell or the gland into the bloodstream. And neurotransmitters are released from neurons into a synapse. Both are specific. A hormone has to bind to a very specific receptor, but it, the target cell can be any cell in the whole body. Whereas the neurotransmitters, they can only bind to other neurons, glands, like the adrenal gland, or muscles, like heart muscle, smooth muscle, or our skeletal muscle. So the target cells are slightly different. And then the last difference is that the endocrine system is a slower process. So the, the hormones are released into the bloodstream and they travel through the bloodstream and they connect to their target cell and then a response occurs. Whereas with the nervous system, the reaction is much more rapid. Now the response with the endocrine system lasts longer and the nervous system response is a little bit shorter. Actually, an example, let's suppose you were startled. Somebody slams a door and you have that electrical startled feeling. That immediate rapid millisecond response is your nervous system. And then the sort of lingering stress effect of that is the hormones. So we have stress neurotransmitters and stress hormones. Now, another cool thing is that Epinephrine and norepinephrine can be both a hormone and a neurotransmitter. When epinephrine is released from a neuron and crosses a synapse, it is a neurotransmitter. When it is released from the adrenal medulla gland, then it is a hormone because it's going to go into the blood. Now, let's have a look at the various endocrine glands, and this is just an overview, so I'm just gonna give you general functions of each of these endocrine glands, and then future videos will look at each one of those in more detail. So over here, we are looking at the inside portion of our brain, where we have our hypothalamus and our pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus connects with the pituitary gland in two different ways. There's an anterior and a posterior pituitary, and we will look at that in the very next video. But for now, the hypothalamus controls the pituitary, and then the pituitary will release hormones into the bloodstream that will impact various other glands in the body. The hypothalamus is very important for homeostasis. The hypothalamus and the pituitary gland combined regulate many things like growth, they are involved in our stress response. They affect hunger and thirst, reproduction, and our metabolism. The pineal gland is this little gland back here, 
and it makes a hormone called melatonin and this is very important for regulating our sleep cycles and our circadian rhythms. A hormone produced by the pituitary gland stimulates the thyroid to produce thyroid hormones, which plays a very important role in metabolism. The parathyroid glands are on the back of the thyroid, and they are four little tiny dots back here, and they play a very important role in regulating blood calcium levels. Calcium is very important for muscle contraction and for releasing neurotransmitters. It's very important for calcium in the blood to be very specifically regulated. The thymus plays a role in the immune response, and we will look at this in more detail in the immune system video. The adrenal glands. Adrenal glands play a very important role in our stress response. And the adrenal glands are on top of the kidney. Now the kidney itself is not an endocrine gland, but it does have cells that can produce some hormones. The pancreas. Primary role of the pancreas is to regulate blood sugar. It produces two hormones, insulin and glucagon. And then lastly, we have the gonads, ovaries in the females and testes in the males, and these are involved in reproduction. So they produce hormones that will help to produce gametes and stimulate mitosis, and they will also stimulate the gonads to produce other hormones like testosterone and estrogen. So some hormones are not produced specifically by glands. Sometimes cells can produce hormones. So an example is leptin, is a hormone that helps tell our hypothalamus that we are not hungry anymore. Leptin is produced by fat cells. It's not produced by an endocrine gland. Same with gastrin, is a hormone that's produced by cells in the stomach that stimulates the release of hydrochloric acid. So not every hormone necessarily comes from an endocrine gland. The last thing that I wanna look at is types of hormones. We can generally categorize hormones as either fat soluble or water soluble, and how they affect the target cell is a little bit different. So when we have water soluble hormones, they can dissolve in water, so they can flow through the bloodstream very easily, and they will bind to their target cell. Okay, so there has to be a very specific receptor for each hormone, so that only the correct cells respond to that hormone. Fat soluble hormones need to be carried through the blood. So they have plasma proteins that help carry them through the blood, like albumin is an example of a plasma protein. So when a water soluble hormone is going to bind to its target, the receptor is on the surface of the cell membrane. Whereas a fat soluble hormone, the receptor is inside the target cell. So let's have a look. In this diagram, we can see that a water-soluble hormone here is going to bind to its very specific receptor on the cell membrane. These are phospholipids making up the bilayer of a cell membrane, or also called a plasma membrane. When the hormone binds to its receptor, it binds very specifically because of either hydrophobic interactions, ionic interactions. Receptors are proteins. They have a very specific conformational shape that allows a very specific hormone to bind to them. When this binding occurs, it causes a conformational change in this protein, which will cause a cascade of events to occur. One of those things is that ATP, adenosine triphosphate, can be converted into cyclic AMP. AMP is adenosine monophosphate. And this molecule acts like a second messenger. And then that will activate some kind of a cellular response. So let's suppose this hormone was insulin. It will bind to a insulin receptor, let's suppose this is on the liver cell, and this cascade of signaling reactions is going to cause the liver cell to increase glucose transporters because insulin helps to tell cells to take up blood sugar. And they do that with glucose transporters. Whereas a fat-soluble hormone 
doesn't bind to a receptor on the membrane. A fat soluble hormone can diffuse across the membrane because it is made of fat and the plasma membrane is made of fat. So this hormone can move through the plasma membrane, through the nuclear membrane, and it binds to a receptor inside the nucleus. And it acts as a transcription factor. So it helps to regulate the transcription of DNA into a messenger RNA molecule, which will affect protein synthesis. So an example of a fat soluble hormone would be say testosterone. Testosterone has a lot of effects on different cells, but one of them is increasing muscle growth. And so when testosterone binds to a specific receptor, it will trigger the synthesis of muscle proteins. In the end, both types of hormones cause some kind of a cellular response and then it's going to regulate whatever factor it's regulating, whether it's blood sugar or sodium ions in the bloodstream. Now, what are hormones made of? So remember the structure of an amino acid. It has a carbon, a hydrogen, a carboxyl group, and an amino group. So when we look at an amino acid, we call that an amine if it can be used to make a hormone. So there are certain hormones that are amine hormones. So those are our catecholamines, which are epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. They are all composed of some variation of the amino acid tyrosine. So the amines are made of a single amino acid. There are other hormones that are made out of peptides, which would be about 20 amino acids. And then some hormones are full proteins, like insulin, is an insulin protein. And then the fat soluble hormones, there are two kinds. So one, I wanna talk about the thyroid hormones first because thyroid hormones are a tiny bit weird because they are produced from tyrosine, but they are made from two tyrosine molecules. When you put two tyrosines together, they become fat soluble. So even though thyroid hormones are made of an amino acid, they are not water soluble. The other major class of fat soluble hormones are the steroids. Steroid hormones are all composed of cholesterol. So let's have a look at those. Here we have a cholesterol molecule and you can see that each of these points is a carbon atom. So these are kind of like fatty acid chains Remember our fatty acid molecules, they're hydrophobic and they are made up of carbon and hydrogen. These rings are just fatty acid chains that are folded around into circles. So cholesterol is generally a hydrophobic molecule. And then cholesterol is altered in different ways to make different steroid hormones. So testosterone, estradiol, which is estrogen and progesterone are the sex hormones. Males and females make both testosterone and estrogen, but males make a little bit more testosterone and females make more estrogen. So those are the sex hormones. DHEA is an androgen similar to testosterone and actually is acts like a weak testosterone molecule and can be converted into testosterone. And this is produced by the adrenal cortex. Aldosterone is also made by the adrenal cortex and this plays a role in regulating blood sodium levels, which regulates blood pressure. And then cortisol is a very important stress hormone also made by the adrenal cortex. So these hormones are the adrenal cortex hormones. They are all steroids. And then lastly, I wanna point out vitamin D. We make this in our skin when we are exposed to UV light or sunlight. So we take cholesterol molecules in the skin and we convert it into vitamin D.